Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'd Habita fillah Continue on in our study uh, Of the, the treaties of the concise creed <coughs> We reached the portion of the treaties Where the shaykh was talking about the sifat Or the attributes of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah he said the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah have their distinct identification with unique qualities different from other misguided sects. These are, this is very important, I think this is one of the most, uh, a very important matter that we need to think about and that you should try to internalize because this gives you a general meaning of Ahlul Sunnah and who is adhering to Ahlul Sunnah so that way we're not quick to take off people off the Sunnah. Nor are we quick to bring people who are not on the Sunnah to say that they're from Ahl Sunnah and how we deal with them. And these are controversial matters and they are important matters. But one thing I will say in my experience and what I've seen in the Dawah is that we have to be cautious about taking people off the Sunnah. This is very important. And I think it's more important that we give people more of the benefit of the doubt than to be quick. And as youth, so this is a bit of advice, when it comes to getting involved in these matters, first study deeply and understand what the Sunnah is. Because a lot of people are in positions, all of us have to blind follow in one way or another. We're on different levels though, depending on if you've done some Talib al -Ilm. Or even the Mashaikh, obviously they have different levels. And they have, uh, they engage in taqlid from time to time, some of the Mashaikh. Or probably many of the Mashaikh, in a sense. That, for example, I'll give you an example amongst ulama with regards to the issue of, of blind following. And I'll bring the relevance for this. Is for example, in this contemporary time, ulama of Ahl Sunnah are pretty much united as Sheikh and uh, Sheikh Abdul Masan al Abad, he mentioned once, he said, the Talib al Ilm, la yistaghni an kutub al Albani. You know, the student of knowledge cannot do without the books of Imam al Albani. He cannot. You know, in this contemporary time. Why? Because that Imam devoted his life learning the Sunnah and defending it and propagating it. And especially with regards to the Hadith sciences, what he left behind is a treasure. It's a treasure. And guess what? And most of us, if not all of us, in the, those people, except for those people who are specialized in that science of hadith and have the ability and have the time and have put in the energy to say, well, you know, Imam al Albani said this, uh, he made this judgment about a hadith, I think it's this. Well, most of us definitely aren't on that level and, and, and aren't uh, strong in the sciences. So mostly we say, al Bani, you hear ulama, you hear ulama mainly uh, <laughs> say all the time in Durus and wasahahu al Bani. You know, basically al Imam al Bani, he said it was sahih or he said it was daif or he said it was, you know, hasan or whatever the case may be. That and that is a type of taqlid. Why? Because they don't have the time. Maybe they maybe they do, maybe they don't, depending on their specialty, as far as to be able to go and check and do what, look at the al rijal and go through those various sciences to determine whether it's sound or not, and maybe they'll come up with a different judgment. The point being is we all have a degree of taqlid. But what we want to be cautious about, so that was an example with ulama. And us as the... Uh, you know, myself as a small student of knowledge, and then, uh, you know, and then the, the lay person who doesn't have any background in, in uh, studying or what have you, you know, we're at a different level. We really depend on so much. We usually say, that's why you say, you know, you come on an issue, you say, well, Sheikh Rabi said, or Sheikh Ubaid said, or Sheikh Ibrahim said, or Sheikh uh, Suleiman, Suleiman said, or Sheikh Muhammad bin Hadi said, or Sheikh Muhammad uh, Ibn Abdul Wahab said, or Sheikh Mukbil said, or Sheikh, you know, we refer to the ulama. Uh, we go back to the ulama because we don't also have that ability to go into depth about those issues and knowing the Sharia like they do. 
or even have the ability to to go into the text and to make a tarji and make a uh, uh, a sound uh, uh, opinion about the issue. So the lay person is more at mercy, is more at the mercy of the opinions or the views of others. You just have to make sure that you're the opinion and views of others from Ahl Sunnah who are known for their elm and their, their benefit. The point I was mentioning this for is that we don't want to get so much into taqlid though because you're still responsible if you spend your time speaking about others and you say, well, Sheikh so-and-so said. Sometimes there are issues between Ahl Sunnah. Sometimes they're between two imams of Ahl Sunnah or many imams of Ahl Sunnah about an issue or about a particular individual they differ over. And then you, who's just a lay person, maybe hasn't even studied, you take a position. Okay, that's fine, you take a position. But don't force others and make your ruling based upon that. What do I mean by that? For example, I've had people who aren't even students of knowledge, who are practically new to Islam, tell me about the events going on across the world, about particular individuals having a conference, or, but what do you say about this, uh, so-and-so, and all those mashayikh are not Salafi except Sheikh so-and-so. How is this person getting into this? They are making taklid of what they heard of someone else who they trust. That's fine, they trust them. But they have to be cautious if they don't have the tools to distinguish what's haq and battle, especially when it comes to speech between the ulama and differences between ahl sunnah or what have you, that they are staunch and forcing others to hold that view. Oh, you uh, praise so-and-so in your lecture, or since Sheikh so-and-so was from ahl sunnah you must be a mubtadi'ah, da-da-da-da, so then, then they operate like that. That's a dangerous thing, because if you don't have the tools to look into the issue, then you're speaking out of ignorance and you are making your taqlid, fine make the taqlid, but don't force and make others and try to derive at a hukum upon others based upon that. Oh, brother, what's your opinion about this? Make an imtihan and nas, and you don't even have the tools to distinguish between haq and bad. This is a dangerous thing. So be careful, as the ulama warn and constantly mention, qadim wa hadithin, in the past up to now, about getting involved deeply in those affairs without having the tools and the knowledge to do so. And that's even for the case for the beginning student of knowledge uh, and, and so forth. As they mentioned, as Sheikh Salah bin Fazan mentions, these sifat of Ahl Sunnah, firstly, we'll go through, he has 14 characteristics he mentions. He says they always adopt the middle path and do not exaggerate, so they're not extreme, either in matters of creed verdicts, or conduct. So that's something we want to try to get. We want that characteristic. The al Sunnati will jama'ah adopt the middle way among all the sects, just as the followers of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi have been referred to as the middle balanced nation in the Quran. So we want to take the middle path. The middle path does not mean we throw away the principles of al Sunnah. However, the middle path refers to being balanced and being on the haq and adhering to that which is right and correct without being extreme and going beyond the bounds. They are contented with the Quran and Sunnah only as the basis of all religious matters. They accept the definite orders of the Quran and Sunnah giving them their deserved importance based upon the understanding of the pious predecessors. Third, Ahl Sunnah have no other leader except Allah's Messenger وسلم, whose instructions they take as being compulsory, accepting his sayings and practices as they are. Whatever is opposed by him is abandoned. Though these people of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah are most knowledgeable about the biography of the Holy Prophet وسلم, alongside his sayings and practices than all other people. This is why they are the most loving of the Sunnah, most eager to follow it, and most loving to those people who act strictly upon it. So it's a very important, that's where our, our asal of our leadership is. We respect, and the ulama are our leaders, and we respect the government officials from the Muslims uh, who are over us and who, uh, you know, call us to good and forbid evil. We respect all of our leadership. 
but the asl of the leadership in the religion, that which is mutlaqan you follow. It means without any, there's no uh, time where there's disobedience and so forth. And that's from the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. That's from the Prophet Wasallam. his, his uh, sunnah. Ahl Sunnah, they abandon completely disputes in the matters of the religion and depart from such quarrelsome people. They abstain from quarreling and com commenting based on their opinions. That's what we're talking about. Uh, they abstain from quarreling and commenting based upon their opinions in lawful and unlawful matters of the religion. They have completely entered into Islam. So that's really a, a matter of taslim. You know, we, <coughs> may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless it with tawfiq to get to that path because all of us, you know, depending on our different levels and our iman and so forth, we may fall astray in that. We may, uh, and, and have shortcomings. So we have to be careful. So whenever you see controversy around someone all the time, that all they are is a fitna for people. All they do is talk about fitna, then know that they are not calling to the sabila of the salaf. They're not calling to the path of the salaf. I'm not making a hukum that they are not ne salafi necessarily. I'll leave that to the ulama. But what they're doing by making those mistakes in that bid'ah, because it's a bid'ah to be a person of fitna. Ah, the sunnah is not a person, uh, not people of fitna. They're the people of islah. They're the people who rectify. They're the people who build. So if someone is calling you always to fitna, always to controversy, always getting you into the, the most extreme issues. Let's look at an example. For example, those youth who are who are influenced by those extreme tekfiri groups. I mean, I, I've known so many of these youth and brothers who deviated and sisters by getting involved with those groups. Some of them, they hardly prayed. They didn't pray in the masjid. They had were involved in the major sins, but yet they were worried about leaders across the globe making tekfir of them. Or they were calling the ulama of Ahl Sunnah hypocrites or murjia and, and you know and all of these kind of horrible names. But these same people made no effort to make hijrah, no effort to make talib al ilm no effort to to do anything fi sabilillah. But instead, they did everything by their hawa and their desires, and following their desires. I can mention people. I'll mention an example of a particular individual who was involved, who was known and had multiple, committed zina in the masjid. This is true. Wa'iyadu billah. But was the first one to talk about uh, doing these higher duties and going forward uh, in, in the religion. Now how is this? This is, these are not the sifat of Ahl Sunnah. These people are the sifat of Ahl Bid'ah and the Khawarij and the Tikfiriyin and the uh, Jihadiyin and other groups, these contemporary groups who deviate from the true path of Kitab Allah wa Sunnah Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the true jihad of, that's legislated by Kitab Allah wa Sunnah Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the minhaj of the Salaf, the Salih, which includes the minhaj of the Fuqaha of the Ummah. So abandon, Ahl Sunnah, they abandon completely disputes in the matters of the religion and depart from such quarrelsome people. Ahl Sunnah tries to avoid these kind of people and these people who just bring controversy and fitna. That's all they're doing. They're trying to get you into some major issue. Brother, new to Islam. Brother, what do you say about uh, Sheikh so and so? Brother, uh, you know, this is, you know, these people were sitting here and da 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 da, and you gave salams. You know, they're talking about major, these are major Messiah, in fact. These aren't e easy issues. Don't think making hijra of someone is an easy issue when it comes to not speaking, giving salams to a Muslim and not uh, giving them their rights for a Sharia Maslaha. That's not a light matter. That matter takes ilm. And that matter takes understanding and fiqh on how to practice it, when to practice it, looking at your situation, when is their maslaha, when is their mafsada, when is the maslaha akthar, when is the, the, the benefit akthar than the, uh, more than the harm. So all of those things are sharia principles. And by engaging in those higher duties before you even learned how to read Fatiha properly, or you learned even how to uh, pray properly, 
and to engage yourself in that fitna, most, more than likely, a lot of those people, they get destroyed. And I can speak from experience. It's been, alhamdulillah, quite a few years that I've been on the da'wah now. And I've seen so many people enter either into Islam and leave Islam or go from one extreme to another extreme. I've known people one day Sufi, next day Takfiri. And then I've seen people who are Takfiri, next day they are something else, you know, modernist. Meaning that they're trying to reform the religion instead of reforming themselves and reforming the community based on the Kitab or Sunnah. And we've seen people going from all other extremes. We know people who were super hardcore. No, and it's incorrect to say super Salafi. And it's incorrect also, you know, that's a belittling term of Salafi, of Salafism. But rather, they're not, because they're going beyond the bounds. They were too extreme, which was not a part of the Sunnah. So that means they departed from Salafiyyah with this extremeness. Or the others departed from Salafiyyah with their so easy to where they just sat and opened the door with everyone. These are ways they departed from the path of the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And with that, as I said, I've seen so many people in other extremes. And there's a real example, I've heard it countless times, I'm not sure if I knew the brother. But to a particular brother, he used to travel from Medina. He was a student, and he used to travel to go to Mecca to see Sheikh Rabi. When he used to live there. Every weekend he would travel from Medina there to sit with the Shaykh. He was Haris al al -ilm. He wanted the Talib al-Alm and he wanted to sit with an alam that was known for the Dawah. And many years went by and brothers related this story to me that one day the Shaykh asked, well, what about so-and-so? Shaykh, he doesn't go by that name anymore. Meaning he reverted back to his, his pre-Islamic name, his name his father and his mother gave him. Christian name, perhaps. He said, Sheikh, he does, he's not even Muslim anymore. And the Sheikh was, you know, it disturbed the Sheikh. And the Sheikh said, I thought that. Meaning that he was, because the, because the man was so extreme. Because he was so hardcore. He wanted, you know, being new, sometimes when you're new, you're so hardcore. Usually when someone is so rigid and so uh, staunch, they usually break. And there's a hadith that show this. There's a hadith that mentioned this. That don't be so stern. Even look how the, the man is ordered to be with his wife. That he should not try to straighten her or she will break. You know, don't straighten her, her, her crookedness. Meaning not that if she's doing evil and stuff. No. But that if she has some shortcomings... That if you try too hard, you will break her. She won't be able to, to last with you. You'll be too hardcore on her. And she will break. So, more relevant to us, we've seen so many people. I've seen so many people that were my generation who left the, the religion, even after a long time. Sometimes because they were so hardcore. And the environment around them was an environment of ignorance. And then some people were even knowledge-based circles, but they were so extreme. And they, they, they got wrong practices and wrong ideas. Because just because a person is doing Talib al that doesn't mean everything about them, their Aqidah is all correct. Even if they study the books of Aqidah, they might have shortcomings. All of us have shortcomings and don't understand all the issues. And some of the issues are very intricate when we talk about Ahl al when we talk about the issue of Tafir, talk about the issue of ruling by other than what Allah revealed, all these major messiah, these are major messiah that not even all the ulama speak about. And there's a reason for that. So how is it that you ask the common person to get involved in these issues? How is it that we, we ourselves get involved in those issues if we don't have the tools, if we haven't studied those particular Messiah and gotten grounded in it's gone with those issues and so forth? So we have to be cautious. And I end by saying, do that which benefits you, as the Prophet ﷺ said, and we'll continue on with the other sifat or characteristics of Ahl Sunnah in the next sitting. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Nabi Muhammad. وعلى عليه وصحبه وسلم